All right, so for the first day of class, the first thing we're going to talk about is what is our workflow? How are we going to do this class? We have a book where we're going to go through the various chapters and then we'll have assignments. But it all happens in our code editor. We have a code editor already waiting for us in this room. At home, you'll have to download the software, either Notepad++ for Windows, Text Wrangler for the Mac, or visual code for Mac or Windows. We've already got Notepad installed. So the workflow is we're going to write our code, check our code, test our code. So uh, go to your Start menu, and you're going to search the Start menu there for Notepad++. Not Notepad, not plain old Windows Notepad. We want Notepad++. It's not built in, you have to download it and install it. So go ahead and open Notepad++ from the Start menu. Now Notepad and Notepad++ are both text editors, but Notepad++ will be infinitely better for us because it's designed for us to write code. Notepad is just to write quick notes and messages and such. We could write code in Notepad++ uh, notepad plus in uh, Notepad, sure, but it's not quite designed to write code. You want to use Notepad plus plus, and it has a bunch of menu items, and we'll look at most of them. We'll get acclimated to the software, but our process is going to be that we're going to write code, save our work, and then run the code to see the result. So in this class, you don't have to write this yet. Well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write some notes. I'm going to write some plain old notes in a notepad file, and I'm going to give you this file in the network folder if you want these notes. You can write these notes on your own, and in a moment we'll write some code. But I'm going to write some general notes, general concepts. Today is the fifth. OK, so modern web design. three pillars HTML CSS JavaScript some of you may have taken our other classes before you may know these answers so don't answer yet but if you if you're new to this class does anyone know what HTML stands for hypertext uh, something or other <laughs> something or other no that's H that's HTSM Hypertext markup language. Okay, so it's a really fancy name for the code that um, powers a website. The basic code, hypertext markup language, HTML. If you know a little bit about the history of computers, which is totally fascinating, HTML in the web plays a prominent role in the history of computers. Does anyone know perhaps when was HTML invented? In the 2000s, true or false? False. In the 1800s, true or false? False. In the 1900s, true. Uh, in the 1950s, in the 1990s, true. 1989. Close enough. So 1989, HTML was invented. It came from an earlier language from the 80s, SGML, actually. And it was invented in 1989 by a college student uh, in Europe, Tim Berners-Lee. You can get some of that information in the book, a little bit of historical perspective. But basically, HTML, the language that powers websites, were invented in about 1989. The general populace started to learn about it and use it in the early 90s. And uh, now, basically, the world has changed, literally, because of HTML. Tim Berners-Lee is one of the most important people in history. It sounds hyperbolic, like, you know, obviously George Washington is important and Abraham Lincoln and all of these figures, Einstein. But Tim Berners-Lee, who is still alive, is one of the most important people that's ever lived because he invented a language that, we, that permeates our lives. Everyone uses the Internet. Uh, you visit, you know, Facebook. You go to your bank. You chat with people. You play multiplayer games on the web, on the Internet. And so all of that 
was revolutionized in 1989. There had been computers since the 50s, since the 40s, actually since the 30s, but there's been computers for a long time, and the thing that is the internet has actually existed since the 60s, but websites, 1989, the Facebook website, your bank's website, the website where you go off and buy tickets to a concert, websites, since 1989. And the inventor of it invented HTML and gave the language out to the world for free. He could have locked it down and copyrighted it and, and, and made a fortune, but he gave that language out free to the world, and literally it changed the world. Think about it in terms of the fun aspects of the web and the internet, and think about like the serious aspects. Uh, people communicate with each other. A few years ago, there was the what was it called? It was the uh, the Spring Revolution, I believe it was called. A few years ago, in the Middle East, various countries, the people overthrew their 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 regimes because their governments were oppressive. How did they communicate with each other? Because the newspapers were controlled by the government, the TV was controlled by the government. All that was controlled. They went on the internet. They made, they went on websites. They went on social media to to change their their, their government. So a uh, big, important aspect of the world, and we can learn it for, uh, we can use it and learn it for free. That HTML is out there. Anyone can learn it. This class, we're going to cover all of these aspects. Well, for a long time, HTML websites were pretty ugly looking, very basic, black and white text, very simple. So the next aspect of web design is CSS. Anyone know what that one stands for? Cascading style sheets. This is from around 1996. So it took a little while before this came out, which is a way to make your websites look nice. This is the basic structure and foundation of this code. To make your sites look nice, CSS. CSS is about 20 years old now. This is a way to <coughs> make the site look nice. So we've got HTML for structure. We'll see what this means as we do it. We've got CSS for design. And then another aspect of modern websites it's JavaScript. Does anyone know what JavaScript stands for? It stands for uh, Jupyter Advanced. No, just kidding. It doesn't stand for anything. It's JavaScript. But JavaScript, uh, this one was invented in, I believe, 1994 or so. And this is for interactivity. You can make your you can set up the structure of your site HTML. This is the content of the site. You can set up the design. Here's the colors, cool drop shadow, place this over there. But then for your website to do anything, it's JavaScript. Question? 95? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So 1995, JavaScript. And it's for interactivity. It's to be able to click and do something. Um, it's for also the ability to create games. You can create games with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, I teach a class uh, for San Diego City College in making apps, making Android apps, iPhone apps, apps for tablets, games, all of that. I teach that using those languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And <clears throat> if you know if you learn those languages, you can create a you can create a structure for your app, a, a, a visual design for your app and interactivity. And you can make games. And I teach that class and it's for devices. Yes. Uh, can you use JavaScript to develop apps for iPhone? You can. Device? Exactly, yes. Um, so, I'll mention it in more detail later, but if you make a note, the other college I teach at, sdce.edu, San Diego Continuing Education, 
search classes um, mobile apps you just search for my last name you will see the classes over at San Diego Continuing Education my classes there are free this class was some amount of units two units I think and you either paid out of pocket or through your BOG the class the classes at South Western are not free classes at Continuing Ed where I also teach those are completely free um, and I offer this class of mobile apps. The catch is that the, cl the classes are over uh, in Kearney Mesa. You have to go way up there in Kearney Mesa, Aero Drive. You also have to enroll in that other college. But I bring that up because uh, if you're interested in making apps for iPhone, Android, all of that, I teach this free class that teaches you all about that, but over at the other college. Um, starting in the fall, which is like August or something. If you need more information on that, let me know, and I'll let you know later. But for us, we're going to focus on websites, and we will also create mobile-friendly websites, meaning they're not apps, but we're going to create websites that will look great on an iPhone or an Android or a tablet and such with these languages. Focus on HTML and CSS, but touching a little bit on JavaScript, hopefully enough for that you then take CIS 165. That's the class that is the, the more in-depth JavaScript class. So those are the languages we're going to look at. Two of those languages are covered in one book. The third language has its own book, 600 pages. So the order of difficulty is that order. HTML is the easy one. CSS is harder. JavaScript is hard. And you know, I said I want to dissuade people, but JavaScript is hard. But if you put in the time and the effort, take advantage of lab times and all of that, learning on your own, you should be able to master it. Um, people come to my classes all the time with very little experience, and then they create very cool things, and then they figure suddenly realize I like coding, I like programming, and then they uh, succeed. Because those that, l that know the coding aspect of web design are paid more in the real world. They're known as web developers. A web developer gets more money than a web designer. So the difference is that a web designer focuses on graphics and such. Web designer, graphics, basically. Web developer, basically coding. With a web designer job, you know, you get some good amount of money. But with a web uh, developer job, you get more money. So one is very artistic and very cool and fun, but this one is you pay, get paid more because it's hard. More could go wrong. Um, you know, bad code could break a website. Bad code uh, could cause a system to crash and users to lose data. So. Um, takes more effort to become good at coding and uh, you get paid more for it all right so how we will actually write our code we need, we need a code editor a web browser Code editor in a web browser. We have that in these labs, of course. They're all set up, ready to go. On your own computers, you have a web browser, most likely. You can choose your favorite one. And you need a code editor, like the ones I mentioned. Notepad++, Text Wrangler, or Visual Code. There's these other ones, too. Sublime and Eclipse and all of that. Whatever you like. Yes? Um, and I guess maybe we'll talk about this, but some of the code that we do is different, looks different in different web browsers. Will we talk about that later on? We will. We're going to focus most on the on the standards uh, of the code and talk about, uh, to various degrees, interoperability between browsers because each one kind of interprets it a little bit different. So yeah, we'll, we'll cover that stuff definitely when we when we get to the more advanced things. And that's a good point. These languages here are are universal. They have a specification that's defined. They they have a meaning. But every browser interprets them a little bit differently. So technically, these languages, HTML and CSS, are known as interpreted languages. 
um, JavaScript interpreted languages. The, the languages are interpreted rather than a compiled language. If you don't know what that means, we'll, we'll talk about it, but compiled languages, interpreted languages. These languages are interpreted by the web browser. So one code may be slightly different in Firefox compared to Chrome. And that's annoying, and, but we'll see how we can deal with it. And um, something that we need to uh, deal with when we're doing webs websites. In Notepad right here, what we'll do, first of all, you have your brand new Notepad document. Let's go to File, Menu, Save As. How many of you brought a USB flash drive today? Okay, if you brought one, go ahead and plug it in. You can save your work there. If you didn't bring one today, that's okay. What we're going to create today will not be so mission critical that you're going to miss it tomorrow. But if you didn't bring a flash drive, you want to email it to yourself or upload it to your Google Drive or something because it'll be gone when you come back. You're going to save as. I'm going to save mine to my desktop. If you didn't bring a flash drive, at least save it to the desktop so you can find it. On the left side, click on the left side there, click desktop. Before we choose a name, you want to change your save as type. Notepad plus plus lets you ed edit a variety of languages. You change your save as type to HTML, hypertext markup language. And I'll just put, uh, for the moment, today's date, uh, June 5th. Now when we create these files, you can name them anything you want. And I'm about to call this June 05 with a space. Be careful about files when we're coding because a space could actually cause a problem. When we link files together, that space could cause the link to break. So I'm going to avoid spaces. You could keep it like that with no spaces. You could use dashes if you want to be able to read it. You could use underscores. So on my, on my other note file here, I'll make a note. Recommendation. When creating HTML files, no spaces, use dash or underscore. Spaces between words and recommendation keep the name lowercase even having uppercases and such could possibly cause problems when you link your code because if you wrote something as my file .html and something as my file .html they're different and therefore, if you typed code that said link this file to that file, and you typed it lowercase, but the file is uppercase, that's a broken link. So don't use spaces in the file names. Dashes and underscores are fine. And avoid uppercase, lowercase. Keep it lowercase. And then also, keep a project in a folder. We're going to use images, we're going to use videos, we're going to use a lot of extra things. All of those things that make up a project should be in a folder. So I was about to save this with the wrong name in the wrong place. A better way to do this that we will start to get used to as we do it is, I want to make a folder with today's date, and I want to put the files of today's work in that folder. So I haven't finished saving my file yet. You may have done so already, and if you did, that's okay. The better way, following my recommendations here, is I'm going to create a folder first on my desktop. 
The folder can be called anything I want, but I'll put the day's date, and I like to write the dates like this because they organize themselves alphabetically when I have a bunch of files on a USB. If I call my folders January 1st or June 8th and all of that with words, they don't alphabetize because, you know, the month of uh, uh, May actually appears after the month of January or uh, July in alphabetically. So if you use dates like that, this will alphabetize itself easier. So instead, make a folder, whatever you want to call it, I'll put in today's date, and in the folder, I'm going to save the file, and in there, I call it whatever you want, and I'll call it June-05, no caps. You can change this, of course, if you already did it. You can call these things however you want. If you already have a system, that's fine. Uh, if you're learning brand new, I recommend my way. You're going to have various opinions all over the place how to learn how to do this stuff. They're all right and they're all wrong. The one that's right is the one the instructor's telling you at the moment, however. So I'm going to save that, make sure it says HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. So we have right now, then, the best and worst thing we can ever have a blank document. It's the best thing ever because we can create anything. And it's the worst ever because where do I start? Well, a good 500 page book is a good starting point. Before we write anything, did everyone save that? Any, have anyone having any trouble? Okay, let's check one more thing. Let's go to the web. And let's go to the number one traffic website in the world, which is. Starts with a goo and ends in an oogle. Google. Google.com, the number one traffic website in the world. It gets the most traffic all over the world. Go ahead and go to Google.com for a moment. I'm in, uh, I'm in Firefox. You might be in whatever web browser you want. But I'm at Google. Right click on an empty part of the design. And from the menu, select View Page Source. Every website in the world is set up by default to show you its code. And here in Firefox, I'm looking at the code that powers Google. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of code for a relatively simple looking screen. So all of this probably looks like a lot of gibberish, and it is until you learn it. There's all of this stuff about object. to look at. For fun, go to any other website and do the same thing. I'll go to the college's website, swccd.edu, taking a quick look at our own college's website. Actually, for some reason, it was slow today. Oh, I guess, OK. Go to the college's website, www.swccd.edu, right click on an empty spot, view source. And then you'll see lots of code there also. So I'm showing you this because, by default, the code of every website is freely visible to you. That's great as a learning tool. You visit a website. How did they do that? You view source. You find the spot in the code. And you say, OK, I can do that. You're not stealing their code. You're not stealing their trademarked information. You're looking at the code that makes up that site. It's like, you know, this building is made out of wood and metal and concrete, whatever. I can make my own building out of wood and metal and concrete. That's not stealing. I can make my own website out of this code. The code is out there. It's universal. It's not copyrighted. Tim Berners-Lee gave it out for free. Again, such an important person, so much so that he's been knighted by the Queen. So it's actually Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And so if I look at the code of Southwestern College, I look there, and it's a little bit nicer to look at than Google's. Google made theirs a little harder to look at, but all the code is there. In our college's website, it's a lot easier to look at, divided into nice little sections, color-coded and all of that. And 
these are these are codes that we will learn very soon. The, the title code, the link code, there's something about printing. Maybe you see some keywords here and there about style sheet or JavaScript. I see some things here. I see something that says JavaScript. I see a message, like a, a hidden message here, jQuery mega menu. So you can look at the code for every website and kind of learn a little bit about it. Some code even has secret messages if you, if you find it. Here's Mozilla.org, <coughs> the, the company behind Mozilla Firefox. Hidden in their code is a cool little graphic of the Mozilla mascot. Hidden? Hidden in the code, yeah. If you go to Mozilla.org and then you do the right-click view source, it's hidden in the code. Hidden to most people because they're only going to look at the, at the front of the website. But us, advanced people, we will look in the code and we see a little message. It says, hi there, nice to meet you. So I don't know if they still have it at the moment, but Target, you know, like the Target right over here on uh, East Lake Parkway, they're, uh, they, they hire people on a regular basis. And I, I looked at their... Uh, I looked at their hiring, you know, their uh, their hiring page, and at one point a few months ago, they were hiring people for for web for their website and such. So the application to get hired for the Target website was a test for you to look at the code of their of their website before you could apply to the website. It asked you a few questions about their website it said what um, what did they say it what uh, what code foundation are we using so that means go check out our code and go figure out what <coughs> underlying foundation of, of code are we using over at the target website once you answered all the questions and you um, figured out that answer it it then let you apply so before you could apply you have to kind of like hack into their code not in the bad way hack but hack into their code to to figure it out a little bit and speaking of the word hack hacker we're all going to become hackers in this class no we're not going to steal people's credit cards information and meddle with elections we are going to learn uh, code and the traditional word for hacker from the 60s in the 70s was someone that was hacking away at the keyboard learning and coding and experimenting and having fun so the original word that has really been lost in the popular culture I don't think we're gonna get it back the original term of a hacker was a good term years ago nowadays you're, you're a hacker and a lot of times you know first knee-jerk reaction is oh you're gonna hack me steal my credit cards etc but we're gonna learn good hacking question when you're looking at the code yeah, definitely. This uh, this shows us, for example, in the Firefox code, uh, all of this nice color coding. This is uh, this is part of uh, why we want to use a civilized code editor like Notepad++. So we'll talk about why there's different colors in a moment. <coughs> yes, some sites are have their code in in black and white, like Google over here. Some of it's in color, some of it's just in black and white. But we'll talk about what that color coding is all about and why it's useful. Yes. So I'm using Visual Studio Code. Mm -hmm. Is it going to save my code by default, whichever language I'm using? Uh, when you do a file save as. Uh, I believe there you can choose your type of code, and if not, you can type you know the name of your file .html, and it should save it as HTML code because it might not know what code you want unless you specify. So check that on your save as, or make sure you have the extension of .html. So we have the ability to save. To view the code of different websites and copy and paste it that's fine the original nature of HTML was for this Tim Berners-Lee made this code and gave it out free to the world and basically wanted everyone to be able to look and share each other's code things 
uh, haven't worked out completely in that utopia, but uh, open source software and, and all of that is very common nowadays, and we can share all of our code. You, know, you can't look at the code that makes up Microsoft Office. Uh, you can't mess with that code. You can't edit the code that makes up you know, Mac OS X. I can't uh, edit, hack that code. That kind of code is proprietary code that they've locked down and that you could get into trouble for really even looking at or editing. But HTML code is open and, and, and free and accessible to everyone. It's the nature of it. The, uh, for such a simple site, the Google homepage has 316 lines of code. Firefox is telling me there's 316 lines of code. Looking at the Southwestern College uh, website, we've got 1,500 lines of code. Looking at Mozilla, Firefox, 1,700 lines of code. So lots, of, uh, lots and lots of code lots and lots of places where things can go wrong. Interestingly, target is only 971 lines of code. The thing with this code is, depending on the language and depending on what you're trying to do, this code may be forgiving or very strict. So, back here in our notes, HTML is forgiving. CSS <coughs> more strict. JavaScript. What's that? Dark Souls level, yes. Uh, very strict. The the interesting about Java is that they both share the same root, Java, JavaScript, but they are completely different languages. Uh, Java was invented first, and then the team that invented JavaScript said, let's uh, borrow their name because they're so popular, so they borrowed the term Java for JavaScript. So they're completely different languages, but Java is also in the very strict realm. Uh, you need to type the code perfectly, basically, for it to work. What I mean here is how, how perfectly do you have to type the code? Perfectly, meaning the right way, the right syntax. You know, what you need it to do, that's another matter. Typing it right, that's what I mean here. HTML, you can kind of type it a little bit wrong-ish, and it'll work. CSS, you need to follow the syntax and the standard and type it right. In JavaScript, you better type that right, or it just won't work one wrong uh, mistake in JavaScript could break your whole site. And what I mean by that is one character. If this comma disappears, that could break the whole website. That's how strict it is. Not one command or one line, one character wrong in JavaScript could break the whole website or app. This other stuff like HTML, I mistyped content. I forgot a T, let's say, the site will still probably work just fine. HTML is very forgiving. Then when we have CSS, uh, that should be typed properly, but you know, there's a little leeway. But JavaScript definitely needs to be typed right, always. So how do you, if you have a little error like that, how do you go through and turn it down? That's the process of debugging, and I'll give us techniques and advice on how to do that. Because once we start writing this code, we're going to have two big types of errors. Syntax errors and logic errors. So if you type your code wrong, you get errors. You must debug your errors. The funny thing is that in the history of computers, the, the reason it's called debugging is because literally the first error in a computer was a bug that got stuck in the computer. A little moth wandered inside of the computer and it caused it to mess up and then the programmer had to find that bug in the computer and that was the first computer bug, literally a bug. And now it's debugging. So we have to debug our code because you can get two types of errors. Syntax errors 
logic errors. Again, uh, just a quick reminder, all that I'm typing here, I'm going to give to you in the network folder at the end of the day, and you're free to take notes at any time or take my notes at the end of the day. Syntax errors. You type the code wrong. Okay, I should have typed console.log, not dot .lag. Right? That's an easy syntax error. I typed the wrong code, and it broke. Those are a lot easier to figure out. Question? Yes, no problem. Console.log is the right code, not .lag. That's an easy fix. Syntax errors are harder to figure out because this is um, you didn't you didn't type the code how you intended. So unintended code. This type of error is a lot more difficult uh, to figure out. So if I had some kind of code. Um, If I had some other kind of code here, and I uh, did something like that, you know, at the moment this might not make a lot of sense, or maybe it makes a little sense for you if you've had some experience. That is a that is a logic error. I typed all the code properly. I created a variable. I created an if statement. But the problem here, I'm basically saying, as long as we have our variable less than eight, do the following. I created a variable that starts at nine. 9 is not less than 8. So this code will work, but I'm, I, I typed it unintentionally. I didn't do it in the right kind of logical way. I'm saying like, you know, uh, drive to the store, but you don't have a car. Um, this kind of logic is a, uh, error is a lot harder to fix, but as we go through the code, and even the book has a chapter kind of telling you, uh, or maybe it's the JavaScript book. One of these has a chapter on telling, on giving you advice on how to figure out your code. And as we do it together, and we make errors together. You know, we'll we'll see how it works, how to debug. Let's start to write a little bit of code. Let's. Uh, we've got a brand new blank document here in Notepad plus plus. The very first thing that we type here. We have the .html extension, but we still need to define what type of document and what version of HTML we're using. We're currently using the latest version, HTML5. So there's been various versions in the last 20, 20 28 years. Um, we want the latest version. HTML is made up of tags. And a tag, a code in HTML, always has this. Syntax. Syntax is the way you type it. On the keyboard, we have the less than and the greater than symbols, comma and period. Shift comma gives you less than. Shift period gives you greater than. Everything that we're going to type is going to be in those symbols, those brackets. They can be called angle brackets. It's the less than, greater than symbols, right? One is less than two. But inside of there, we're going to type a tag. Um, inside of that tag, then we'll type the exclamation point, Shift 1. And then D-O-C-T-Y-P-E. As you're typing, Notepad might pop up and give you hints. For the moment, we're going to uh, ignore those hints, your code editor, visual code and such might give you hints, and those are great to let you write your code quickly. But as a beginner, ignore them, because you know it's better to learn this stuff manually. And later on, we can use the, the quick hints. I'll show you how to turn that off if you don't want that to pop up a little later. We'll type D-O-C-T-Y-P-E, doc type. We're defining what kind of document type. If you've had experience in HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, the first few lessons may be a little slow, because you know this. But most of us are, seem to be starting off in a pretty basic level, and that's fine. We'll start basic, then intermediate, then some advanced. So hang in there. Space. I'm still inside of the angle brackets, and we'll type HTML. 
the type of document I'm writing is HTML. This is the document declaration tag. I'm declaring that I'm writing HTML. Conceivably, I can change that to other things to show that I'm writing other kinds of code. But that's our standard code that we're going to write. We don't have to write a number five or anything like that. If you've done web design for a while, we know that we would type the different version numbers. This is just how it is <coughs> at the moment. Enter line two. Next, we'll type the HTML tag. Less than, greater than. And inside of the less than and greater than, we type the tag HTML. Again, I'm going to press escape to ignore that if you want. So HTML tag. Most tags have a pair. So HTML syntax. We use angle brackets. Less than, greater than for your tags, your code. We have HTML tags. I'll explain why they're called tags in a moment. Most tags, code, has a pair. Start tag or starting tag, HTML. Ending or closing tag. HTML. You see a difference? What's my difference between the starting tag and the ending tag? The forward slash, the slash. We have a slash. So when we write these tags, they will often have a pair. It starts here, ends here, with a slash. So in our code here, let's press enter a couple of times. Line four. Less than, greater than inside of there, slash HTML. Once you type that, it should then highlight. It found its pair. If you, if you clicked inside of the tag, it found its pair. It makes a little note. This starts here, ends here. This is right here, this is right here. It's connected. This is a pair. Closing and ending tags. It yes. doesn't show that little line on when you did, uh, it might not be saved as an HTML file. Uh, you file did a save as and you saw that I selected uh, HTML here but it seems to be going back to all types I'm not sure why that's happening so I selected HTML but I also typed .html that's how it will know what your language is that's kind of odd so you should see that there's color coding and such if you don't see that Let's fix it before we go on, because then you're not using it to its full potential. So this is to show you, this is what a real code editor is all about. You're going to see line numbers, highlighted code, color-coded code. We'll see what the colors mean and all of that. All of them have this. Visual Code, you know, Visual Studio Code, Sublime, uh, 
uh, Text Wrangler, they all show the code in some sort of way. Because if I'm using plain old Notepad, even if I, uh, you know, save it as the right file type, it's just going to be black and white text, and that's very annoying to look at. It's not color coded. It's not connected. It's it's just hard to look at. That's the difference between looking at the code of uh, the Google home page, you know, that's hard to, to look at and to edit, as opposed to looking at the code of our, of our website, properly color-coded. Like yes. It, it, it all would still work, even in plain old notepad, but it's just going to be much more pleasant to write it in a real code editor. Because then you can see if, like, if you're missing a bracket or, or a slash or something. Yeah, look at that. So let's say, you know, I'm typing my code really fast, I'm not paying attention. One of the codes doesn't look the same. The HTML that I type properly is blue, and the one that I type wrong is not blue. I'm not saying that the color will always be blue or whatever color, but they will look different. And even if I click here, a moment ago they, they connected and were both highlighted, now one of them is not highlighted. That's one of the hints that we will see in these code editors. Something might be wrong. So in my case, I forgot the angle bracket. Inside of the HTML block, um, go back to line three and then press tab. The thing about HTML is that, again, it's very forgiving. Of the three languages, it's very forgiving. So this tab that I wrote here is not even necessary. I can keep my code all on the same left side. I can write code here, write code here, write code here. But if I tab this code, to different levels of tabbing, it's going to be a little easier to read and work with. We see that also like in the code of, of these real websites. Look at how this code is tabbed in, indented, because this is a block of code here. You might be, not be able to tell why at the moment, but this is a block of code. And one way is that it's indented. This code goes with this code here. <coughs> So tabs and spaces are optional, but they're very useful for readability. Whenever anything computer related comes up, there's people going to have opinions, and very strong opinions. Even for this, some people hate tabs. Some people want to type a couple of spaces. They're all right and they're all wrong. However you want to type your code is the right way. And, and the most right way is the way the instructor teaches you. So I'm going to type a tab. I'm going to type a tab. I, I like the tabs. It's a nice amount of space. But some people, you know, you're going to get into a holy war with them and they're going to say, no, three spaces is what you need. Great, you're right and I'm right. But whatever you want, I'm going to do tabs. Tab, and I'm going to write another tag, another pair of tags. This one is the head tags. And quickly, I'm going to stop saying less than, greater than, slash. I'm going to say head tag. And that's a shortcut to mean your opening head tag, your closing head tag. But obviously, what I did here was angle brackets, head, angle brackets, slash head. Opening head tag, closing head tag. Put some space in between. Enter line six. Body tag. So less than, greater than, inside of those, body. Couple of enters. Less than, greater than, inside of that, body, slash body, that is. And the syntax here where it is not forgiving is that you do need the slash first. Sometimes beginners put the slash at the end here. In this case, no. It's body, slash body, head, slash head, HTML, slash HTML. No one has asked yet, but the answer is no. There is no doc type pair. That's one of the ones that does not have a pair. I guess you can write it if you want, but it's not really necessary. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't do it. There is no doc type pair. So you don't need that at the end. This is one special case, and we'll see a few special cases where there are tags that are a single self closing tag. Question? What does the doc type, uh, what does it do? What purpose does it serve? 
It defines that the following code is HTML. The type of document is HTML. We could have other types. In theory, we could have other things like XML, which is another kind of code. We say the type of document that follows is XML. So the code that follows is XML code. Or it could be CSS or Yeah. Yeah. Doc type. No. You want one. Uh, that's the one you basically want. HTML. But within the document. Oh, once you finish the code and then you write doc type again. No, we only want one doc type per document, the very first line. But if I want to write some CSS or JavaScript, we will be able to write it in here, even though we've started with HTML. So that doesn't limit us to only HTML. We will be able to write CSS and JavaScript within the HTML a little later. So pairs of tags. Most of them have a pair of tags. All of these so far have been color-coded blue. Notice if you then click on a tag, it should find its pair, purple. This is one of the ways to debug your code. This happens so often that you've got these few hundred lines of code, you know, a small program, and then you're kind of figuring out uh, what, what happened. My code is right. It's all blue. Well, there's a very subtle error right here. And the way that I would figure it out is, OK, I'm going to click that first tag. I find its pair. Click the second one. There's its pair. Click the third one. Didn't find its pair. What's the error? Slash is missing. So it's not going to pop up to tell you your slash is missing. Other software does actually. You know, I like Notepad, but on some aspects it's a little simple. Other more modern editors like Visual Code will tell you you're missing a slash or there's other issues. That's very good. But I want to start with a very beginning level about doing it all completely by hand, making our mistakes and learning from them. That's why I'm avoiding selecting <coughs> the little helper text, and I'll tell you how to turn it off in a moment. I want to do it the most basic way. I like to teach things the hard way. And then once we've learned the hard way, then we can use the shortcuts. There was a slash missing. Um, inside of head, we'll write, well, I'm going to tab, because in each section, you can have different code. It will make sense what to write in each section as time goes on. But I want to write now another tag here, title tag. couple of enters, slash title. And inside of, inside of the title block, another tab. Again, these are all optional. You can keep all of these tabbed in to the same level, like that. And that'll work just fine. But I like to tab them in when they're part of a section. And now with title, I've tabbed in further. And I'm going to write my first, you're going to write my first website. Now you may, have you may have created a website before. Just pretend this is your first website. So the way our class works is we write some code, we save our work, we run the code. Notepad is telling me so far that the code has not been saved. The little floppy disk here is ready, has not been saved yet. Click the floppy over there to save it. We'll go to File, Menu, Save, or press Control S to save. There's lots of ways to save. So save your file. You always want to save your file before you run your code. Go up to the Run menu, and then choose a, choose a browser. Launch any of these browsers to see the result. write your code, you save your code, you run to launch a web browser. Launch any one you want. I'm going with Firefox because it's just the first one on the list, whatever you like. I'm going to go with Firefox. Hmm. It's blank, or is it? What's, what happened to the text I just wrote? My first website. It's on the top. It's on the tab at the top of the browser. 
So the head block doesn't display content in the main body block. My first website appears in the title. Target's website, target, expect more, pay less. In their code, if I browse around, I'm going to find blah, 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 title somewhere. Not right there. So on Target's website, there's their title tag. And that's what appears on, the, on their tab. Now they have other stuff that we'll look at later. But um, our code, our website is getting the same basic building blocks as that big famous website. Let's uh, now go into the body block inside of body. Traditionally, when someone learns a language, the tradition has been that we all make it say a certain thing. We're going to keep the tradition going. When, whenever we learn a language, we often have it say, hello world. So inside of body, type hello world, save it, and launch it again. You can go back up to run, launch the browser. So hello world, I tabbed it because it's part of the body block of code. I'm going to save it, run, launch Firefox. If you've already got Firefox open, Right, your monitors are nice and big. You can have your code on one side and the browser on the other. If you already have your Firefox open, or web browser, or whatever, you can just refresh your browser after you've done the save part. You don't have to run it every time. You just refresh it. I like to launch it every time, because what happens is it opens in a new tab. There's the version where it only had title, and there's the version now where I put something in the body. So I like that, that it shows a progression of my code every time you do run launch. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I end up with like 30 tabs in my browser, but I like to see that progression. If you don't, you can just refresh your current window and it'll refresh your code. People sometimes, though, forget to edit or to save their code when they edit. So they say, why didn't my code work? Well, you're, you haven't saved icon is still red. So this is going to be our process. Type code, save code, run code. The web browser interprets the code, processes it, shows it on screen. Yes? Um, do you recommend putting in the code before you put in the text? Or does it matter? I would do the code first, because that sets up your structure, okay. and then the content. But they're kind of intertwined. I usually do both at once. I write my HTML code and, as necessary, start to add the content. Unless it's really complex, like a bunch of paragraphs. I might fill that in later, but I want to create the structure to be, this is a paragraph. A picture will be here, and then I might add the detail as I go on. Now, HTML, hypertext markup language, markup language. ML. We've been doing that here. We've been marking the document. We've got a document of HTML. We've been marking. Let's mark that this will happen in the title. This will be visible in the title. We've marked it. Tag, close tag. We've marked this. We've marked that. That's what the ML is, markup language. We've marked something. Later, we'll mark this will be a picture. Later, we'll mark this will be a link. That's the ML in HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. The HT part, we'll look at it later. But speaking of markup, I can further mark the Hello World to define it, to define its basic structure. Let's go back. I'm going to go back to line 9, and I'm going to write the Heading 1 tag. Every tag I've written so far, HTML tag, head, title, etc., has been what I've said h1 tag is a, is a new, slightly different one, where it's going to be h1, heading 1. I'm marking start heading 1 here, and then end 
heading one here. So it needs a pair, as always. Looks a little bit different in that I didn't put H1 on its own line and close a, oops, that should be H1, sorry, H1 slash H1, not H2. There we go, there's the pair. So it looks a little different. We've seen these others that there's a, there's a tag on its own line, there's some content, and then a tag closing on its own line. That is valid, and that is valid. It doesn't care. The web browser doesn't care. It interprets it if you keep your code on one line or multiple lines. More readable is multiple lines. Start the tag, add the content, add the tag. More compact and efficient is same line. Start the tag, add the content, end the tag. Both are valid. You can do it however you want. I switch between the two because what I personally like to do is when there's only like one simple sentence, I like to keep it on one line. So I would have put this all on one line. Title, my first website, end title. But I'm going to break up multiple lines when it's much more content. If I write a paragraph of text, I'll start the paragraph tag, add the content, and then end the paragraph tag. So for our notes here, HTML may be written. HTML may be broken up into multiple lines or not. So we have tag content slash tag, or we have tag. There's no tag tag. It's just generic tag content. Both are fine. And then tabs, spaces, how you want. There's a tab, or three spaces, or whatever way you like. OK, so we wrote the H1 tag. We were marking the text, hello world. Save it and run it, and see the result, the result of marking the the text so if I run that hello world a moment ago that was hello world puny and now here's hello world mighty big and bold because we marked it h1 yes sir. In Visual Studio, what you'll have to do is just go, go to, to your browser. folder, yeah, and then double click it to open it in the browser. So, um, hello world, it's been marked big and bold. And guess what? We're having so much fun coding, class is over. <laughs> two minutes ago, they stopped paying me two minutes ago. <laughs> so, this is how we're going to do the class. When we come back tomorrow, we're going to get much more in depth following the book a little bit more. But here's the big idea. We're going to write this code. Uh, we're going to create this structure. It's boring right now, black and white. Later on, via CSS, we'll change the color. We'll put a background image, a gradient, a drop shadow. We'll align this text next to that picture, CSS. Much later in the course, then, we'll, we'll do interactivity. You click a button, and a pop-up happens with a welcome message that knows your name. JavaScript. So we have a lot to learn, but we've got two whole months. We're going to cover a lot, little by little, like this. Plenty of lab time to get working. Um, homeworks and all of that. Final project. That's our general concept. This that we worked on here, you can take it with you if you want. I'm going to start over with a new document next time just to practice. You can keep this one if you want and show your friends and family. Look at that. I made my first website. And uh, when we come back tomorrow, 9 o'clock, we're going to start again and um, start kind of using the book a little bit more. If you have the book, browse it a little bit, and you'll see that the concepts of HTML are pretty attainable, and then we'll get to CSS and JavaScript. Any general questions for today? Notes. Let me put the notes in the folder right now.